Ready? All right. I'll call this meeting to order. And we'll start with the pledge. And a presentation. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Full house tonight. Feels good. Art on the wall. It's exciting. All right. So, if there's any member of the public that would like to comment on an agenda item, please fill out one of the blue comment cards located in the lobby and give it to the board secretary. If you're attending virtually through Zoom, please place comments in the chat and the secretary will call on you at the appropriate time. Comments are limited to three minutes per individual. Current policy allows for any item on the agenda to be open for comment. Um, I just want to remind everybody tonight to enunciate your name, speak loudly when we vote um, or making a motion. And um, agenda item 2.0, Superintendent Sweeney, are there any written communications? We've had the one regarding the Epic Times article, but I've kept the board up to speed on that. Otherwise, no. Um, let's see. So, um, are there any questions or comments on any of the items listed under 2.0? Anybody? Oh, good. Okay. So, um, hearing none, um, communications and presentations, are there any questions? Still uh, let's move on to 3.0. All consent agenda, I don't, all items on the consent agenda will be approved by a single motion unless a member of the board or Superintendent Sweeney requests that an item be changed, removed, or voted on separately. Are there any changes or additions to the board agenda or the meeting minutes? A lively group tonight. <laughs> Um, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Member Dean Grange, so moved. Member Nelson, second. Hearing that. Motion and a second. Can we do a roll call vote, Tanya? Member Nelson? Yes. Member Dilly Grange? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Pullman? Yes. Member Brownell? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Lowe? Yes. 4.0 reports. So 4.1 principal report. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, two of our wonderful career and technical education teachers, Courtney Lear and Jake Lear. They're here not actually to represent uh, what they do in the classroom, but after school and uh, refinement, continued refinement of teaching of students after school through Skills USA. So they're going to give you an overview of what Skills USA is and how many students have benefited from that. Uh, through the years of Grants Pass High School. So I'll turn it over to Courtney and I'm like, Jake, please you need a hand grabbing some stuff. He grabbed it. And then, Tom, did you have our that will be done by Peter when you're ready? Okay, I have the person. Um, we want to put on the first. We'll start off with that. Hello, I'm uh, Jake Lear with the uh, Metal Fabrication and Skills USA. Um, have our state president right here. Hi, <laughs> I'm Caleb Alfred. I'm your Skills USA Oregon State President. And uh, last year's uh, fourth place at the, the welding all around. Nationals. My wife, Courtney. Hi, our teacher. And uh, last year we had one of our big girls go to nationals as well. She got 16th at nationals. So the best my program's done at nationals that compete against uh, 
some pretty tough um, prep schools. <coughs> East Coast was probably the hardest to compete against. So they've been doing it a very long time, and that's where it's based. And they uh, tend to uh, run the show, so it's up to us to catch up. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of getting there. We've got a little ways to go, but um, we're traveling back east, seeing what they're doing, and making sure that we're bringing the best practices we can back here. So. Um, we're going to get started with the uh, the PowerPoint, but uh, before we do, I just, that's okay. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it talks a little bit more about Skills USA, but um, just a little bit about the competition at nationals. You have to win your state to go, or the person that won the state can't go, and you get in that that, that position. Uh, so <clears throat> you have to score enough points in order to go. Uh, it's a comprehensive. You, you have you take a comprehensive test about what you're competing in while you're back there, and then for welders, bakers, culinary arts, they're given um, an information packet about what they're going to be doing when they show up, and they get this on uh, when they get to their competition. And basically, um, I'll just kind of give you the welding side. They give you a WPS, which is a welding procedure specification. So they tell you what you're doing, what your parameters are, what you can and can't do with the machine. Because trust me, there's some there's some folks back there that can uh, they can really make those machines do some interesting things. Uh, <laughs> but they keep it within reason so that everybody it's, it's about as level playing field as we can get. So they get a blueprint. They have to set it out to the blueprint. They have to make the weld sizes and the type of weld they ask for in the position that they ask for. Uh, and there's five of these in here. So they do the four. Uh, most prominent uh, welding processes that we use, which would be, I'll just use the lay terms, big, TIG, stick, dual shield, and oxygen-settling cutting. Um, and they also have a world skills competition, so if you do place high enough, you get an opportunity to go uh, compete to make that position. That's every that's every couple of years, so that's, uh, they had this, they had one, they had it here in America this year at Lincoln Electric, and we ended up third as a country. Um, but it's pretty amazing to see what they what they do when they spend forty hours plus a week just doing what they're doing. So, it's, what the Olympics of welding? The Olympics of welding, pretty much. Um, so, <clears throat> this year, this is something Bruxton put together, and this was actually the number one scoring uh, aluminum TIG weld uh, in the country as far as points went. Um, we dropped some points, or he dropped some points in some other spots, but it was it was a really tight race between one through five. Uh, so. This right here, if you want to hand it around, look at that. That's the lightest of them, and I'll let, I'll leave these up here for a while if you want to see these. But uh, this was the uh, this was um, Bruxton's MIG weld a wire feed, and this was right up there in the top two or three. I'm not sure exactly where it scored. That's pretty heavy. I don't know. <laughs> um, so that's this here's. And then uh, I, the last time we had. Uh, the last time they had a nationals on site, we was in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, I had a student by the name of Abe Novesti go, uh, and Abe ended up sixth back there. So as of right now, for the state of Oregon, Grants Pass has the two highest finishers ever at uh, the national competition for Oregon, which is fourth and sixth. And I brought Abe because well, Abe is pretty stellar as well. So this was the number one uh, MIG weld at nationals that year. And this is a little lighter. Here. <laughs> this is heavy. <laughs> one, one second, and then uh, go ahead. And while those are going around, uh, I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, at the end I'll try to field them the best I can. But uh, at the state level. Um, <laughs> We do it just kind of a smaller version of what these are, and they're trying to streamline. We're trying to change some things because there's a, there is some uh, at the state level there is some equity issues. I don't want to be all saying that it's the best thing ever at our state level. We're trying to improve it. Um, some of the problems we have is funding, and then having well, <laughs> but we are finding partners. We have some great business partners in Central Welding Supply, Air Gas, uh, Industrial Supply, and what they're trying to do is help us get every student in our state on the same machine mm -hmm. so that they're not, you know, you're not welding on a 1985 Hobart and then the student next to you has a 2020 um, state-of-the-art Lincoln 350. So there is a major difference in how these things perform. Uh, unfortunately, this year, some of the kids, 
we went up there and there was a big discrepancy on what was available and then at the same time um what students have to practice with so i'm going to go ahead and turn it over to caleb right now he's going to take us through uh i might intervene at times to add a thing or two hello everyone's caleb all right then so Skills USA is something that's very important to many communities around Oregon and around the United States. It's just something that really encapsulates all of every technical career you can really go into. We have welders, we have business people like me. I do like the job interview and the pin design and things like that. We have culinary, we have nail tests. They like to nails. I didn't know we had that, but that was fun. And there's really anything. If you can, if you think about it, we have it for the most part. So, Skills USA is a trade school preparation. We really focus on trades and we focus on all of them, whether it's technical or whether it's just something simple like speech, like, hey, what is your name? What do you do? What grade are you in? Simple things like that. We kind of compete in really anything. Um, there's state level competitions and then there's national level competitions. And the state level competitions are a lot more broad. We have a lot more state competitions. But then if you place high enough in your state competition, if there is a national competition, then there's the national portion of that, which is very similar. It's just on a bigger scale, like Jake was saying. It's just on a bigger scale, and it's at a bigger event. Um, I'm, I am going to say one more thing. It says trade school preparation, but on top of that, uh, Skills of State Nationals mantra is uh, career ready day one. So a lot of these students that go back and compete at nationals, um, they, it, they'll hit a certain set of uh, parameters and if they do they get a certificate and that certificate is pretty important because they can get hired uh it just basically acknowledges that they've learned the skills necessary for that career at least mm -hmm. at an entry level um, and sometimes further than that okay yeah so these are just some of the competitions within our photo just study um like i said we have nail tats we have metal workers, we have wood workers, we have really anything they can think of. One thing that I found very interesting is we have cutting lumber, like you can just go and cut down a tree. It's kind of like what they do. And um, that's just some, that's like the diversity of this whole kind of program that we have. And one thing that we're really focusing on this year on my end as the state board directions is we're focusing on really opening more chapters within schools. Uh, there's something that we have, there's a lot of schools that are participating in it, but it would be even greater to have it as big as FBLA or as big as all these other things because it does have everything and anything. Yeah, yep. you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, this is kind of fancy. <laughs> so, we. Okay. So, this is kind of what STOS USA stands for. We have something that's called our framework. Our framework is just kind of the base program of what we really want to achieve within Skills USA. So this is just kind of a breakdown of it. And then the next one is just have a good one. Yeah, I want to kind of Maybe I don't have the force. <laughs> right. There we go. So there's a bigger version of it. So we have technical and career. Um, just that's the blue portion of it. That's basically just talking about like metal work as within the school. So your CTSO program, that is what we really focus on. If you have a CTSO program, you can have Stills USA in your school. And so as long as you have that portion, Stills USA is open. We have what we have. Oh, wait, I can't that CTSO, far. by the way, is Career Technical Student Organization, and we, they have leadership within it. So, mm -hmm. so there's a leadership portion to it. Yeah, that's the benefit. That's what I was trying to but yes. you want to advance? No, one second. So some of the benefits that we have is for one, it looks really good on college resumes. If you want to go to college, just even if you don't want to go for welding, you want to go for something that's just business attire or something like that, then you still have this on your resume and it looks extremely good because colleges will see that you're active, you're involved, you're doing something within your school. That's not something that's like, oh, you know, sports. Everyone does sports. Every school has sports for the most part. This is something that you really have to go out there and search for. You really have to find it. You really have to do good in it. There's scholarship opportunities within Skills USA that you can also apply for and you can do within Skills USA itself. And those scholarships are more career technical scholarships. So it's scholarships for welding, it's scholarships for maybe you want to do career and debate. And so it's things like that. There's a lot of job experience right outside of Skills USA. You meet, like Jake was saying earlier, you get like a certificate. 
and that certificate really just proves that you are able to perform at a high level. But you also, while you're there, you meet a lot of industry people. You meet, for instance, we have a lot of our judges are National Guard. And so they kind of do kind of their recruitment is there. But you also meet like people who are good at job interviews. So I got to meet a whole bunch of people that were like, oh yeah, this is what I do in the National Guards. I just hire people, that's all I do. And they're like, your job interview is good or your job interview needed this. And there's like little things like that that you get at the state and national side of it, just little criteria that you kind of meet. So yeah, I still don't know the That is the last slide. So with that too, I wanted to add for Caleb, um, Jake and I have known Caleb since, I don't know, Coach well, youth third, wrestling third grade. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of our students, especially ones that go into a more of a leadership role, they go into this not wanting to public speak. If you were to ask Caleb fifth or sixth grade, he would never have walked in here. And he's getting these real world experiences that he is actually having to push himself and speak to, I don't know, on an average month, do you speak to usually? This is 10? the smallest group I've had in the past like six months, this is this group right here. <laughs> um, I'm usually having to talk to a whole bunch of people that are like this level, just all at once. And it's kind of terrifying, but you get used to it, so. So really pushing them out of their comfort zone is, is great to get them into, not just colleges, into industry, and be able to come back and show um, their education in high school or even middle school level. Um, a few years ago, we actually had um, South Middle School, they competed at the middle school level for engineering and uh, cake decorating. So we took... That was going good until 2020. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we that. Uh, yeah. 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 But we brought middle schoolers, not just the high school level, but middle schoolers to nationals. Um, so that's another level. One thing I'd also like to speak of is, so uh, Caleb's our third president we've had here uh, since uh, we've been doing this eight years. Mm -hmm. So he's the third state president we've had. We've had a couple of vice presidents, a secretary, um, several voting delegates back at nationals. So we do try to hit the leadership side of it as much as just the, uh, uh, the, the, the skills side of it. We've had uh, outside of just culinary, we, we also have a, a pretty, pretty, active uh, robotics club that is, that competes we also have had early childhood development state champions we've had that competed at nationals we uh, we actually started entrepreneurship and business at our state uh, we added that grants Pass high school did so that we could compete in that um, we'll be doing that again soon some things got dropped off the ticket uh, in 2022 uh, but uh, we'll be bringing those back here shortly um, Overall, I'd say in about eight years, we were closing in on something like 65 or 70 state medalists and at least 20 something state champions. Last year in welding alone, we, we won every welding individual process when we were there. Um, and competing, and, and, and it's kind of neat, the kids, the students really do, uh, they see what it takes because, and not just in welding, but in other areas, because they're competing against uh, magnet schools where, like say, Saban Schellenberg, uh, Clackamas, and then the SeaTex in Salem. All the students from the different big high schools they are magneted to this these these places that focus just strictly on those things um we're lucky enough that we get to be here on campus with everybody else i i wouldn't have it any other way if i had my 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 say um because i i really like that part of it um kind of rambling here a little bit <laughs> but uh but it does offer a lot of really it's, it's hard to cover in just a few minutes all the different things that we've been able to do with it and all the things that i think we can do with it uh down the road uh i was gonna let Darkson talk a little bit um so we also treat this a bit like a sport uh you know if you uh go out and compete in wrestling or in, in football or anything you try to go to the camps or you try to be in front of or, or learn from the best of the best my mentor is a two-time American Welding Society Educator of the Year. Um, he comes out here to work with my students because I get him to the level where he can finish them. He's a finishing teacher, kind of, if you will. You get him right to that, and he gets him right to the age razor's edge. Um, and Bruxton got to work with him, but uh, also hopes to go back to Ohio this year. Uh, we're going to be competing in a new competition called Project MFG. It's an East Coast-based project, and the students can win lots and lots of scholarship money for that. Um, but he also got to talk to and meet the world team members 
and actually had a good conversation with one of them while he was changing out the parts for us. And you want to talk about what Nationals was like for you? Yeah. I was way more nervous than him, by the way. He was just like, it's cool. I was like, no. <laughs> yeah, I just, when I was back in Nationals, I mean, I had a lot of pressure going on me and stuff, but I just tried to think of it as like another football game out on a Friday night where hitting a baseball or something, just trying to make it fun. Just I, my dad does not force me to stay in the shop at all. Like I kind of have to beg him. <laughs> <laughs> so like sometimes I'll just like, I'll get over amped about something and then I'll realize it's just, well, then, like I, I'm not as good as I am and I put all this work in and I don't do as good as I wanted to do. It's just, I can keep on getting better. And I was young last year and hopefully I can go back this year and hopefully win nationals. But I also got to remember that I, well, I was a three sport athlete, but hopefully I can get the rest of me. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> just got to remember that a lot of these kids that were back there, like that's all they do is just well. So and they're seniors, and yeah. and there should be a so way. I finished. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished first in my age group, and then first for probably the juniors and stuff too. I think there's one kid back there that was one year older than me, but I just like to say that everybody like here, like the school also gave me money to go back there and they supported me and all this stuff. But I also got to focus on like that, my good grades first and keeping that close to 3.5 and trying to get all this stuff and making sure that I keep on doing the best brother I am, best student I am and good for my family and stuff. <laughs> And then there was one slide that uh, I meant to show. And this is kind of one of the fun things that every kid gets to do when they go, go back to nationals. We all, can you want to hold that up? Yeah. We actually want to, it's really, really hard to get them all, but the state director that we used to have does a drawing and we actually won the drawing a couple of years back. And uh, so each state gets their own pins. There's also Navajo nations. There's specialty pins that certain ones that are harder to get. They only make a few of uh, that, you know, <laughs> You have to mortgage your house to get some of them, <laughs> uh, but uh, because they know what they have, kind of thing. But it's really fun because the kids get to meet uh, students from other from from other states. Uh, one of my friends, Dan Kernion, over in Red uh, in Redmond, uh, he's hilarious. He's out there with the kids until ten o'clock at night, sometimes in the lobby, trading pens with other teachers and kids. And he's really, really good. He gets them every year, all of them. Every year. I don't know. It's like the Disney adults. Yeah. <laughs> they, have like, they have like the pins and the backpacks and everything. This is our version of that. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot of fun. The kids meet a lot. Of so for their communication too, right. they're like actually talking to other students and like having fun. Uh, even though they have these crazy tough competitions, they're actually <laughs> uh, letting loose and introducing themselves to others, which is very rare in this day and age. Best part about it. New places that you've never been, uh, learning stuff about Georgia. So, awesome. so uh, I'll go ahead and open it up to any questions. Jake, you had a neat story from alums a couple of years ago that competed at nationals and then felt moved enough to make a donation to skills. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so Dan was one of uh, he was a former student, and we were going back to nationals, and uh, he. Ended up going back and welding back east, and and he called me up. He said, "Hey, I'd like to donate to the team going back." I said, "Awesome." <coughs> Anyways, a thousand dollar check showed up from him. That's pretty darn neat yeah. for a nineteen year old student to send a thousand dollars to his buddies. But um, and that is another thing about some of these industries. These students can go out there and they can make unrealistic money to you know what we would really believe um, until you see the paychecks coming in on a week. A one week paycheck, and the kid sends you a picture, and you're like, Oh my god, <laughs> so it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's not all there is to it, and sometimes, uh, sometimes they get that money a little bit early, and then then they go play a lot and buy a lot of things, and, and then they stop doing it. And they go, Oh my gosh, we need to get back to that. So, so it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's it, <coughs> for my own kids, I hope that I'm able to do that a little bit better. It's, Keep them from those pitfalls, but for some kids that have, that have never had money like that or any money, uh, Dan kind of loves Spurgeon and he sent us a thousand bucks and he's still doing good. He's in the military now, but and the same with the scholarships like those scholarship money is a lot. It sometimes it's full ride scholarships if you're good enough, it's it's a lot of money and they give out they 
don't necessarily give them out to every kid, but it's like if you really work for it, you you'll get something. It's kind of like our Redwood, our version of our Redwood scholarship. Like if you just apply, you're gonna get something. And that's kind of how Skills USA is. But it, it doesn't it definitely helps if you're like a high performer in it. I have a question. How often do you guys meet as a team to prepare for these? <laughs> when we get closer to competition, usually January, we start. Um, I'm usually in there three, four days a week after school, um, two or three hours. Uh, and it kind of depends on how serious the team is, too, or how serious the individuals are. But I'd say once a month, then once a month as a big group, and then individually with their teachers in their in their area of study, probably two, three times a week after school. And then there's schools that do it every day, there's schools that do it every month. And then there's like me on the state board. I have 10 hours at least every week. So you're, you are the president of the state? Yes. How did you get that role? Um, you, it's like kind of the same as like applying for a job. You apply, you go through this really long application process actually, you apply, and then you have one interview, and then you're supposed to have a sudden interview. I didn't have to have a sudden interview, but I know my other two officers did. So I had one interview with just my coach, and then the other two officers had an interview with Wendy as well, <coughs> our state director. And so that's kind of how that goes. But then me personally, I have a lot more meetings now than they do. I have to meet with our board of champions, which is like our district board kind of is kind of what I have to do. And I have to act as like a barrier between them. And, and on a normal year, the other two presidents, they actually uh, was a little bit different this year, just kind of getting back into it. So they normal on a normal year, they would actually prepare a speech. And then if there's other people running, um, the state delegate voting delegates would vote on the state president. Yeah. Um, um, this year, it was an application process, and then the leadership uh, person that is paid to do the leadership part of it chooses who they want to have as the president, and so on and so forth. A little different this year, but they'll get back to it. Yes, yeah, so we're working really hard to get it back to everything. And so, long process because we're still in transformation of okay, we can go to non virtual things to make them into actual things that we can do in person, especially with like visiting chapters and just talking with all the advisors across the world. It's very tempting. Some people are still like, oh, are we still doing virtual things? And we're like, not really, but we still can. <laughs> we have all of the opportunities to still do that. I think one thing we didn't talk about, but one of my long-term goals with this is to bring the state competition down to Southern Oregon since we make up three quarters of the delegation. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I don't quite understand why North Med for Eagle Point Grants Pass I mean, we, when we go up there, that's all you see other than Saban Schellenberg and CTEC and, and very few other schools. And we have the room to do everything they're doing up there, but I'd like to see it come down here since, like I said, we're making up three quarters of it and it's, we're spending that money every year. This kind of gets more, it's going to be really difficult this year, but uh, so hopefully that's something we can make happen in the future. Plus it'd be fun for people to be able to come to town and see what, what it's all about without having to go to work. But we're working on it. We are. We are. It's a long. We're process. getting fought <laughs> very hard. To the nail. Are there any more questions? No. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jake and I have conflict this. So. <laughs> uh, Parkside Elementary. All right, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Trevath and Mr. T, we call him, our life skills teacher. Um, and he's going to just do a quick um, presentation on what he's been doing at Parkside. Hopefully, your clicker works. Let's see, just a second. Let's get started. All right, fix it up. That's all right. Yeah, I saw pop up there, so there it is. Folks, do you want me to stand over there? Because my neck from staring this way, we can stare the other way for a minute. If that works. <laughs> that okay? Sure. Yeah. I stand over here. All right. You go now. Yeah. <laughs> Site based students love Janet. So uh, I get to talk a little about inclusion and least restrictive environment here for our students. So my name, oh, oh, oh darn. Well, there were some funny pictures under there. Um, I'm Wade Trevathan. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Mike. Silly chicken hat on. Uh -huh. uh, so I teach life skills and I, I work for this guy, but more importantly, I work for these students here. Uh, that's kind of how I think about it. My life skills class. We have a huge range of abilities and skills and life skills, especially this year. So at an elementary school level, we are kindergarten through fifth grade. We have that differentiation to begin with. 
we have everything going on. We have genetic syndromes, seizures, students that can't speak, can't talk, can't eat. We have deaf, blind, autism, braces, wheelchairs, everything you can imagine. So it's a really wide area. <coughs> and we do a lot of fun stuff in life skills. So we learn a lot of different ways. Here we are, uh, Common Core State Standard. We're working on an inclined plane, of course, using Hot Wheels, because that's the way to learn about that in life skills. We're using our movement dice, throwing them with our therapy dog there, Max. Get a little movement brain break. And who doesn't like car scissors? Uh, Jaws of life. So we had that fire uh, men come out and work with our students. And this is all fun and wonderful and important ways for uh, life skill students to learn. But every student deserves that least restricted environment of the gen ed class where they can be exposed to the curriculum and their peers. So this year, we have 11 students in the program at Parkside in our life skills program. Uh, and three that we were able to push into gen ed in a significant way. So that's 27% of our program. That's a good number. I like that. So as I thought about this, we've been wanting to do inclusion. It's really wonderful for students. Uh, gen ed loves it. My students love it. The teachers in the school love it. But during our pandemic years, we've not been able to do this. So we've just started. So I kept thinking, what do we do? The first thing is be really deliberate in choosing the teacher. The teacher and the student match is important. So look at the grade level, talk to the grade level team, all three or four or two teachers, whatever it is. Collaborate all the time. I'm really lucky. My teachers are really involved. They come and talk to me. We're constantly trading work samples, seeing how students are doing, what works, what doesn't. But more importantly is make a schedule and stick to the schedule. Just live and die by the schedule. Um, it's a confusing piece, especially for life skills students. But when we can point to the schedule and say, no, this is where you're supposed to be. It's your orange block. You're going to move over here. And it, it helps a lot. So I get to play a, a little Where's Waldo? Can you see the life skills student in this picture? This is a general ed fifth grade classroom. Exactly. No. So our students in life skills, they blend right in. Um, it's my friend right down here in the middle. He is working diligently and focused. So this guy had a huge trouble coming to school, had a lot of behaviors. Um, he experiences autism. And so sensory experiences really push him. Um, we worked on building trust, teaching him how to take breaks and request breaks. And we were able to integrate him into fifth grade. That was really cool. Here's another picture. Where's Waldo? Can you see our life skills student? The answer, of course, is, is no. And she is right in the middle, uh, sitting crisscross applesauce. She is uh, uh, deaf, uh, nearly completely deaf, but working with her gen ed peers. So this is what I'm really seeing. I love inclusion. I love being a part of it. Uh, when I joined Parkside, the first thing we did was drag life skills right into the assemblies. And everybody really likes to, to, uh, to, to work with them. Um, the biggest thing for me is this quicker growth through peer modeling. So I've already seen in these two months that we've been here, my students who are included, uh, you feel like they're overwhelmed with the content that they're getting in Gen Ed, but seeing their peers do that work, seeing the level of work, it really pulls them up. And so that's been amazing. This increased self-management, uh, watching my students be more regulated within themselves and that expanding group of peers felt so good. I walked into my student into the classroom and she had known some students from inclusion last year. And when she walked in, they all yelled her name out. Hey, and they just love their friend. And to see that those friendships and bonding made between life skills, which is a site based and closed program where they're often isolated from the rest of the gen ed is wonderful and wider community acceptance. I like that it normalizes disabilities among general ed students. They start, they stop seeing the disability and just walk right on up and say, Hey, how you doing? So here, I'm going to wrap it up really quick. Uh, surprising event. This is kind of the, the wonderfulness that can happen through inclusion. So I had a, uh, a site-based life skills student who was in fifth grade. Uh, we moved him into the classroom, and inclusion has been so beneficial to this student. Uh, we got him off to outdoor school, and I got to accompany him to outdoor school. He wouldn't know who he is in this group of uh, fifth grade boys. What an amazing thing. Here he is right in the middle, exploring, doing the wonderful outdoor school stuff of digging bugs out of a creek <laughs> and then identifying them, of course. Yeah. Um, but just wonderful. And for, for me, that's what that's what inclusion is all about, uh, taking a life skill student like this and making him feel like this. This is a, a fellow who would sit in the corner, crawl under desks, slam doors, and he feels oh. wonderful himself. He found his peer group. And so that's been the, that's what it's all about. So that's what inclusion is done.
And so now my challenge is these students were kind of ready for it, a little more academically uh, prepared. I'm going to start thinking about and finding a way to get my really severely medically fragile and other students into the agenda classroom in, in some manner or not. But other than that, thank you very much. Awesome. And if you have yeah. questions, I'm happy. Anybody have any questions? Hey, good job. That's all. Yeah, we'll do more inclusion and I'll come back and talk to you in a year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on to 4.2, uh, planned course statement. Principal Shunk. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Oh, well, oh. Not yet. Hang on. And he's talking and he's got his earphones on. And we'll do the sign with you. <laughs> Go, Gary. We can't hear him. I'll try it again. Can you hear me? It was over here coming from the cabinet. Am I coming from the cabinet? It's a late. <laughs> I'll tell you a spooky story. Let my speaker out. <laughs> can you hear me? It's coming from a Sort of. Our uh, technician is coming out strong. <laughs> oh, can you hear me now? <laughs> Should we try it again? I can put it all in the chat if you'd like. Would that be easier? Uh, stand by. <laughs> oh, I'm really here as the quality control for the Zoom company. While oh, we're standing by, can I have uh, Jake share with everybody first responder day at Allendale? Sure. Take it about. Yeah. 90 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So on Friday, uh, we had first responders come out. It's kind of an on site field trip for K through fifth graders. Um, they came at 11 during Kinder's lunch and stayed all the way to one o'clock for our fifth grade lunch. Um, we had a couple of uh, police officers there, Grand Pass Public Safety, uh, sheriffs were there, uh, two fire trucks, an ambulance, and the mobile crisis unit, which was the coolest thing. A giant huge uh yeah it was huge I, i've never seen it before and i said that's probably a good thing because you just shows up to like swap situations capped the day off at the end of the day with um with a helicopter mercy flight landing on our field oh, wow. so it was awesome yeah brought all the kids out of yeah i went on the intercom we didn't think a helicopter was gonna be able to make it because um because of the weather and at the end of the day got on the intercom and said the eagle is landing in 15 minutes the whole school went out <laughs> Got around our track and watched a helicopter. Ride. So very cool for the kids and the community. So pretty special day for everybody. Something awesome. they're gonna remember forever. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, it sounds like it's still not working. Am I still coming emanating from the closet? Well, I heard chimes coming from here, yeah. here so I thought we were Do you guys want to? Can you hear me at all? Okay, Mike, try it again. All right, can you hear me? Hey! 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 Now, you, now you're too loud, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first I've heard that today, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thanks for letting me zoom in. We have parent teacher conferences here tonight on campus. So I wanted to be here and be available <laughs> for, for parents and students as they show up. So I appreciate that. Thanks for that. Um, so I'll try to make this quick and painless. We've got a new course we'd like to offer called Current Events. It goes along with our onboarding program with Gladiola Way. It's taught by a social studies, highly qualified, endorsed teacher. And I'll, I'll read the course description here really quickly. It's a nine to 10 week elective course that examines current trends, cultural, social, and historical trends via news items, documentaries, recently published nonfiction articles, and internet news. Students will learn how to discern the validity of news content and analyze current local and world news stories. This course demands that students engage in discussion, reading, viewing, and presentations that are the basis for their understanding of culturally relevant ideas. For example, one of our units deals with fires in the West. Not only will students read a variety of news items, they will know who, what, where, and become better news readers while learning about their local and wider world. 
We're going to integrate social studies concepts and materials and close reading skills. And students will take ownership of their own assessment as well as the material on a daily basis. Um, so this is gonna support uh, state standards for social studies as well. And a lot of this is, is one of the first classes they'll take at Gladiola, helping them research and find good, reliable information. We all know that there's a lot of information available at our students' fingertips, but we want to teach them an intentional, pragmatic way to find good, reliable information um, that's going to be fact checkable, be able to cross reference it with other sources, be able to discern the validity of the source and maybe pull out any bias or anything like that. And so um, we thought this was an important elective class to roll out um, to our incoming Gladiola Way students. Any questions? And so this is Debbie Brownell. Where will you be getting the, the source material? A lot of it's going to be um, from the teacher looking at local news, um, state news, national news, and worldwide news, and getting it, being able to determine looking at news sources to see if there's any potential bias, um, you know, looking at a, if you're looking at an article on climate change and it's sponsored by BP or something, having students be able to analyze that, is it coming from a, a reputable source? Is there any potential bias there? But most of it's gonna be focused on kind of fast fact checking and cross-referencing, finding reliable sources of information to, to, find, to find their news information. You know, in kind of, with that looking at social media these sources on social media that a lot of students have at their fingertips being able to determine and kind of wade through that what's reliable and what's not thank you all right i'm sorry for the rookie in the room here are we supposed to do something with this request yeah, you're going to take action on it, and uh, all new courses um, that offer credit are action items, and the board will need to vote to approve this class. This is a little bit out of our normal sequence because Gladiola had a need for sec second quarter. Typically, we do plan course statement reviews in January. This did go through our parent advisory council, and they really liked uh, especially after we talked about standards related to bias and what's uh, how they're going to go about fact checking and stuff. Um, appreciated what this class is offering, but it is a little bit out of our normal sequence of approving courses at the highest level. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Shunk. You're welcome. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Um, moving on to 4.3, ninth grade success, Director Evans. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be brief, and Rochelle's going to come up here and steal the show. Um, data is starting to get released. You saw the school report cards, district report cards were released recently by the Oregon Department of Education. Those are posted on our district website. One of the pieces of data is ninth grade on track. Um, a lot of research out there that shows that if you can keep a student on track defined as six credits or more by the end of their freshman year, they are more likely to graduate from high school. Um, as, as data starts to come out, there's a couple of things I just want to make sure are really clear. 2021 was a year of comprehensive distance learning. Um, really proud of the outcomes related there. Um, you'll see there as a district, 76.5% of our freshmen ended that year on track. But when we came back last year to the 21-22 school year and students were wearing masks in the class and we had a lot of other issues going on related to, um, we also started to disaggregate data and you're gonna see this in our um, all of our data going forward. Gladiola High School will be separated out GP Flex will be separated out. Um, our district number did drop just slightly by a percent, um, but really proud of the work that we accomplished given the circumstances of those two years. And this gal right here is gonna share with you some of the fantastic things they are doing this year. Um, and we've already seen because of their work, her and the uh, mentors that we have, an increase in our students on track. So Michelle's gonna come up here. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Rochelle Watson. So I'm the ninth grade success coordinator, um, and I was English teacher uh, at Grass Pass High School before that. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're going, and then some of the things that we're really doing this <coughs> year. Yeah, okay. So this is our motto. You'll see if you ever get an email from me, you'll see this is at the bottom of our email. It's underneath our signature. It's underneath I have four adult success mentors. Um, it's underneath their signature as well. We really believe in this. We believe that every student can graduate and that every student needs at least a little bit of help. Our mission is to provide students and families with a partner who already knows how Grants Plus High School works. With a partner, a student is never alone and families always know who to turn to for help. So that is our motto. I did steal that, just changed the name from David Douglas. They're like, my <laughs> <laughs> Um, So just to recap what we did last year, in 2021, 2022, we had six teacher teams. The teacher teams were made up of an English and a science teacher that we worked really hard to get the same group of kids with those two teachers. And then we had a math representative as well as a, a wellness or PE representative on every team to try to just um, offer insight as to what they were doing in their curriculum. Um, and we met monthly to discuss specific students. We looked at our yellow zone students, our kiddos who had two or three Fs with generally good attendance, but were struggling. So they were mostly there, but they're still having a hard time. And we would offer interventions. We would offer things like making sure they were requested for study hall, phone calls home, positive messaging, after school tutoring, just all these interventions that we could possibly think of, we, we offer the positive incentives. Um, I have four mentors that I work with. Um, last year, they were in our Reach for Success class, which has been a tremendous class to help support <coughs> students just figure out how to be better high school students. Um, and Sarah Craven teaches that. She does a phenomenal job with that. Um, so the mentors are in reach classes. And then last year I have one mentor who's very strong in math. And so she was in math classes. And just being more accessible to students, they're each in two class periods. And they got to know so many more students who weren't necessarily their focused students that they were, they were mentoring at the moment. Um, what we did, what I like to call drive-by mentoring. So we we're trying to keep kids in classes as much as possible. So the mentors would be outside the door when they're coming into class and being like, hey, how are things going? What about that assignment? How can I help you? Um, or they'd be like, oh, I'll walk you to your next class. So there were very quick um, interactions with students. Um, and then we also did after school tutoring. And then we did something that uh, we call step up, which is offered generally at the quarter or the semester. It's an after school, just super intensive, like get as many kids as we can to come after school and get things turned in before the grading period is over. Um, and we really focused on our yellow zone students. Again, that's two or three Fs with about 85% or better attendance. Um, and last year, that number is wrong now, um, but when I ran this, we were at 78.5. I think it was 79.3 is what the actual final number ended up. So that's what we did last year. Um, but, we felt like when we were in our teacher team meetings, we were talking about the same kids. We were talking about the same interventions and we just felt like we were spinning our wheels. The mentors were frustrated, the teachers were frustrated. It's like, I don't know how to help Billy. We've tried these 45 different times doing it and he's just not responsive. So we knew that something needed to change. Um, so we also heard from teachers that the monthly meetings we're, it was during the prep time, um, it, was, it was paid, um, but it was just overwhelming. I mean, that hour of prep is precious. And so um, we knew that something needed to change. So for this year, what we did is we really shifted up river. So there's this really cheesy video that I showed a lot last year. Um, and it's all about how the kids were falling, this village, kids are falling in the river and all the people in the, in the village are downstream just trying to get kids out of the river, just trying to pull them out of the river. And then it talks about how you go upstream to help prevent them from going in the river. And so that is our, our process for this year. We are trying to shift upstream. So every teacher on campus is on a team this year, on a student talk team. Um, there's the ninth grade team, which is about 85% of the teachers. <coughs> and then there's the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade teams. Um, ninth grade success this year, we were able to better pair English science and mostly was able to get a PE or a wellness teacher because the more students you have in common, the better conversations you can have. 
Uh, we have more staff involvement. So elective teachers, you saw two of our most amazing elective teachers up here. The amount of information they have about kids and the connections they have with kids was being lost at our teacher team meetings in previous years because they weren't a part of the conversation. And so this year, everybody's involved in a team. So we have our um, all of our elective teachers, um, almost all of them teach ninth graders. So most of them are on the ninth grade team. Um, and we meet during Wednesday mornings and then PD days. So it's not taking away from that time that is just so needed for them to be in their classrooms. And then we're offering universal interventions this year. So instead of individual tiered interventions for one kid, what are we going to do about Billy? We're looking at the whole. Why are these kids falling in the river? And so that's what we really kind of focused on. So some of our universal interventions, one of them is uh, we're doing a planner. So we, we know that students struggle with organization. I mean, it's just like every survey you take, every conversation you have with teachers, it's, they are so, they're struggling with organization. So we're moving up river and we're looking for something to be more consistent and helping to support the students. So what we did is we developed a, men, a planner and actually it's based upon Sarah Craven's planner that she made for REACH. And I just was like, let's mass produce it. Take, take REACH off of the title and make it just for all kiddos. Um, so the teacher's role is to display the weekly agenda at the beginning of the week and then to monitor students as they're filling out the planner. The student role is to actually write down the agenda um, and then they'll use that with their mentors. Study hall teachers can use it. Um, and so that's one of the things that we've been doing. So I have a couple of samples of, of planners here. So the pl pink planners are from um, quarter one. And um, you might, there are some names on here. So you might notice the name and be like, oh, wow, that kid maybe struggled a little bit earlier on. But if you look at what they're doing, it's pretty impressive, um, like how they're using the planner. And some of the cool things that are in here, um, every week, so it has their, the weekly agenda that students write down their, their schedules in. But additionally, it has like, well, this one's not filled out. That's okay. It's a bad example. Um, <laughs> they can like do a checklist. Like there's opportunities for things to remind them of. There's inspirational quotes. Um, there's sparkles for every week. Um, so like here, we have a weekly goal. So they, they can fill this out. So um, here are just, if you wanna look at them, those are some used samples. And then here's, you guys, you guys can have those. Yeah, you guys can look at the new ones and just take a little look. Um, but we have found that the planner, the goal of the planner is, again, to go upstream and to help make things so more, um, more consistent, because we know how important consistency is for students. And when you have seven teachers all doing something, a little bit different. It can be really overwhelming. Um, so this is this is designed to be the thing that is consistent, and we're working to make it more across the board and more consistent with our teachers. So that's the planner. Um, I did. Whoop, the force left me too. <laughs> what do you need the force to do? I just need to. Oh, there it goes. Oh, too far. Okay. So this is just time for you to kind of scroll through. I also had um, asked some students to just share um, how the plan is going for them. So I borrowed all these from Sarah Craven, who is our REACH teacher. All the students who are placed in REACH are either recommended for it by their middle school teachers and counselors, or we placed them in there because we saw from the data that they were struggling a little bit. So again, most of them are students who we, we know that if we can just get to them a little bit earlier, they can really benefit from how to be a student. So um, there's just a quick little video. Oh, all oh, the technical oh, stuff. To recap, she's saying, Ms. Watson's the best. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> she's my favorite. Rochelle, did the kids get um, like points for doing that? Do they get? It depends upon things? each teacher. Each teacher does it differently. Like some of the teachers go by every day and initial it. Some teachers make it like I have an academic tutorial. It's part of their weekly planner check. Um, so every teacher can do that differently based upon their classroom style. Thank 
So are these um, part of the um, AVID curriculum that uh, people have been training in and brought back? Yeah, AVID recommends having a planner. Um, and so all the all ninth grade teachers use this and the English teachers are my beautiful guinea pigs that hand them out because everybody has an English class. And so um, they are used in AVID as well. Like the AVID teachers, like, can I have mine early? I wanna get them rolling on it faster kind of situation. But it reach is a very AVID, it's, we kind of call it AVID light. It is a very AVIDized class. So it, it would fit very, it fits very well with that. This reminds me, I don't know if South has it, but Finder Reminders uh -huh. at North. And yeah, and I, what we did is last, familiar. last spring, we looked at just a cookie cutter planner that came in the mail and got put in Ryan's box. We looked at, um, which is it North's plan? Does North have a planner? Or yeah, so and we looked, I think South has one too. So we took those, we took Miss um, Craven's, planner and we just said hey what do we like about it what do we not like about it what would we want to change and then we're we make it for each quarter if you well this isn't working yeah we can email it to the sure board. yeah it's that totally works. fine they spoke beautifully um what i did and what what is i'm sad you're missing is that at the start i think there are four four or five students i had speak each one of them, their GPA has improved since eighth grade. And so they started off by introducing themselves and then saying what their GPA was and then what it is now, what their goal is, and then how the planner helps them. So it's a really cool little video. Um, I highly recommend taking a little look at it. So, all right, but we shall move on. Do I present? Yep. Yeah. And we're thinking. Oh, there we go. And then too far. Okay. So then some other um, universal strategies that we're doing, uh, relational capacity, this, these were things that were already on the radar for um, our teacher focus this year. Some ideas that teachers came up with last year for um, some really cool uh, relational capacity activities, making sure you're greeting students by the door, um, relational capacity activities within small groups. So like anytime you have a seating chart change, do a quick relational capacity activity or at the start of every group activity, because if you don't feel safe, you're not going to feel comfortable enough to really challenge yourself. So really pushing for additional relational capacity activities. Um, having three positive comments before a constructive comment. Um, the, the analogy there is you got to build a bank account before you can help withdraw. Um, in my classroom, I was always said like seven, seven successes before students can overcome a failure. Um, and then really just a one-to-one -one ratio of positive to constructive comments on feedback. Um, and then the other uh, upstream effort we have made this year is to help reduce failures. So <clears throat> a lot of that happens when students have lack of supplies. When you don't have that pencil, it's it can be very daunting to like one, ask for it, get up when things are happening. So um, for this year, we really are looking to provide additional materials for students. That includes departments have been asked to provide um, more like more pencils, more paper, more highlighters. They should just be at students' disposal. And then teachers providing without judgment. Um, it can be really frustrating to have pass out the fifth pencil the fifth day in a row, but for some students, that's what they need in order to be successful. And then teachers were given two extra Chromebooks and chargers to store in their room. As we know, we're still very much on the computers these days. And um, when students aren't, don't have their computer for whatever reason, they are missing out on an entire hour, hour worth of time. And that can be really hard. So those were two of our additional upstream efforts. And then the uh, mentorship. So like I said, I have four adult success mentors. So the mentors are the ones who are really down river. So we're teachers are all up river trying to keep kids out of the, of the river. And then the mentors are there just trying to pluck them out. So um, teachers are in their teacher team classes. So um, one mentor is assigned one English teacher and one uh, science teacher. So that mentor knows what's going on in those classrooms. They are in the classrooms a lot. Um, and then so they for sure were they're heavy in there their first two weeks of the semester. They're in there at least once a month. And the mentors are in our reach classes as well as in our math classes. Um, and then they're working with students. They do empathy interviews to get to know the students before they even talk to them about academic efforts. 
Um, they do SMART goals with students, they follow up with them. And then at the quarter, we're referring students to counselors who are either not responsive to our supports or who have gone to our red zone, which is four or more Fs. And then some supports we have, we were really lucky to get an additional space this year. So we have an entire classroom, um, which I would encourage you guys to pop by and see it's in 229. Um, and the mentors have just made it such a welcoming space. One, we always have snacks. So like kids know where to go. Um, we have comfy chairs, we've got space to work. Um, we are open before school, during lunch and after school. We have study group after school, Monday through Thursday. Um, the mentors delivered, mentors and um, some teachers helped out. We delivered welcome packets to every student coming in to ninth grade. Um, every student who is, you know, like gate was not locked and dogs barking at us. So, <laughs> um, so we tried to make initial contact. Um, and then the mentors are the point of contact, kind of like with our mission statement. Students don't know, there's so many people to ask questions of, and it can be overwhelming. So the mentor is their point of contact. And then obviously they do the mentoring. They, they talk to the students, they figure out what's going on. They help them figure out what resources they might need or who they really need to talk to. And um, we offer after school supports and then we connect students with counselors and we really try to connect the students with the teachers. Our goal is to help them be better advocates for themselves. And then, so just looking at last quarter, I know it's kind of small, um, looking at 2021-22, Quarter one, we were at a 67% on track rate at this point. Right now, we're sitting at a 73% on track rate. So I'm very excited about that number. Um, I'm hoping that it continues in the positive, but we are seeing some really good um, positive shifts. And that's what I got. Rochelle, how do your family liaison ELL assistants work with your mentors? Yeah, so we advocate, we talk to them often, especially when we're, there's like a language barrier at home that we're struggling with. Um, and we just, we're, we're tight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and luckily they're very close to where we are. Yeah. Like just a little hop and a skip down the hallway. So. So I know that they helped you delivering those. Yep, yes. yep, absolutely. They've helped deliver. They help us with make phone calls. I've had them just sit in the office with me while we're communicating home so that we have the content information, but they can actually communicate. Excellent. Thank you for thinking out of the box oh. and improving year to year. I just had a question about, I really like seeing all the data broken down like this mm -hmm. um, because I can see that of the ninth graders, we have about nine and a half percent that are either homeless or in foster care. Mm -hmm. And those seem to be the two groups that are having the toughest time being on track. Um, the average is 75%, but in those groups, it's 44%. So I'm just wondering if there's any sort of additional supports for those groups that, that can help. Do you want to speak to this? Uh, yes, it's a work in progress. Um, we do partner with Maslow. Um, that's a, a trying to continue to refine and how we improve, um, how we communicate with our ninth grade success team, how they interface with the mentors. Still kind of a work in progress, but it is a resource we can utilize. And then the foster care question is one that we are still trying to figure out. Um, and Vanessa might be able to speak to because a lot of people don't know who our foster care kids are. We are working on better ways to identify them within our student information system so that we have that like like care team knowing who they are. So that's a struggle that we've had in the past that this year we're doing something different to, to identify them. So teachers know who they are and can provide that extra care in the classroom and those extra connections that those kids need as they're being shuttled around and I'm connecting with the DHS I'm that's I'm the liaison for the district now for our foster care system and I'm in communication with them through them so we get notification from DHS we send it out to schools and then my admin flags them in the system so that we can better identify the kids with our Okay. Yeah, and and you're I mean you're not wrong. Like right, we're at a seventy three percent right now for quarter one. Our houseless population has the lowest on track rate, fifty five percent, and the highest off track. So um, they are 
they're identified in the system. I'm, there's some identifications that aren't actually like accurate. So it's a, always also kind of a, a work in progress as to who is properly flagged and who is not. And um, that's who's should, missing that and flag. That should be cleared up by the end of this year as well. Okay, yeah. I, I'm also doing the making mental homeless stuff. And so we're working with the state on the requirements and working with our student information system to make sure our data is accurate. Yeah. But in terms of ninth grade um, success for, we have 31 students who are categorized as houseless. And um, at the beginning of the, the year, I just checked who, who is not already in AVID, in REACH, or assigned a mentor. And there was only a small handful. And so I checked in with them. Um, but everyone has eyes on, on these kiddos because we know that they're our most vulnerable population in terms of on track right now. You also talked about the teachers being on teams. Mm -hmm. Where do, where does um, Tim Burnett fall in? He comes, teams? yeah, he comes to our ninth grade success meetings, especially when it doesn't conflict with his other responsibilities at other schools. But yeah, he he comes in, and when he doesn't, he is the first to respond to the emails. He's the first to be like, "Can I get more planners?" So yeah, he is. He's a part of our process as well. So this directly relates to dropout rates. Um, so you've got a, a ninth grader who's not on track. When are they most likely to drop out? Do you uh, well, uh, every year we kind of try to uh, track that. It's it really is a variable. Um, we usually are able to keep them as uh, fifteen and sixteen year olds, but once they start to get towards seventeen and eighteen year old, making their own, own decisions, parent they don't care what their parents say anymore. They don't care what we say. Typically, they're juniors and seniors when we lose them. Okay. Thank you. And even for the kids who are failing all their classes, we just consider every day that they're here on campus a success. And we just, I read something the other day, like you can't teach them today, love them today, right? You can always try to teach them tomorrow. So that's another motive that we really try to focus on. So the, um, I'm particularly appreciative of the looking upstream part, because we've had a number of discussions about that we actually know these students back when they're in elementary school. Mm -hmm. And so looking upstream to keep them from being in the river, <coughs> really appreciate the work that you guys are doing for that and um, still keep pushing the idea that we should graduate from elementary school mm -hmm. because they still believe us. <laughs> yeah, and we do partner with the middle schools. So I'm in the mentors and are in the middle schools often in the spring. Um, and we really want their input for how we can best support students right out of the track. So we meet, we sit for several hours and we're like, okay, does this kid need reach? Do they need a tutorial? Do they need immediate time with their mentor? Do they need, or um, a counselor? Do they need a mentor right away? So we really try to catch them right from the moment they step on campus. Summer school. Before. Oh yeah, we also do our summer bridge program. So that's um, students who again are struggling academically, but then recommended by uh, the counselors and the teachers at the middle schools as somebody who would just be better off if they felt connected to the campus before that first crazy initial ninth grade orientation day. And if you have not been on this campus on ninth grade orientation day, you should definitely <laughs> pop by because it is it is just a, a circus of amazing production that happens here. So <laughs> we um so we're really thinking way outside the box, but when we recognize these young students, do we maybe shuttle them into some of these life skill classes like welding or things where you know I, I know if I had no interest in math but I may really enjoy welding. Are we at least trying to put them in a position where they can have some life skills where, you know, they may not have a college degree, but if they know how to weld, they can at least have a profession and something to take care of themselves throughout the rest of their life. I mean, is that, what do, well do, yeah. you know, what do we do in that kind of, in, is there anything like that that we look at when we working with these kids. Well, kind of prioritize the like Yeah, yeah. So we also like um, one of my my professional goals this year is to try to make sure that um, students are connected <laughs> to a campus or a club, an activity, a sport, because we know that if students are connected to something on campus, they're more likely to be here. And if they're here, we're gonna get them at some point, right? Like we're gonna catch them somehow. Um, and so we do love to make sure that our ninth graders are getting into um, high uh, requested classes um and we try to keep them in there as much as possible um so is there 
it's just that we've identified some of those kids that we, we know if they're reluctant and they're not liking their schedule. Some of those conversations happen in the summer, like mm -hmm. in summer school. I mean, we've done some freshman home visits in the past right. that we try and align them with a class that they know they want to take. Yeah. Especially if they've had a lack of academic success. So you'll get them in the end, is what you're saying. That's the that's a that's a phrase I can get behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Four point four British SIA annual report. Yep. Um, we're required by law to report to the board and the community um, our work during the 21-22 school year with a student investment account. What you have in your board packet are two pieces of paper, two things. Uh, the first one is displayed up there, the um, answers to some narrative questions about what were our observations and learned experiences during the 21-22 school year. Uh, so not surprisingly, you'll see a lot related to social emotional behavior and uh, really struggling with supporting student behavior um, in our classrooms that continues today. Uh, obviously, last year, um, as you know, we had a lot of problems with recruitment and retaining of our employees uh, and the cost of materials for some of our identified student investment account activities increased. Then on the second page of that report, if you want to scroll, Pete, is uh, we have to engage our community in this work. And I'm going to pause there and let you know on Tuesday, uh, next week, November 15th, we'll be doing a community engagement activity. We hope to see you all there, where we'll be looking at the investments we've been making, looking at our student outcome data, identifying what are our strengths and what are our areas for needed improvement. Um, we also have a survey that's out in our community right now, uh, our staff is taking it. We have some student focus groups taking the survey, and then we have um, the community groups being community. Uh, we've had a number of communities groups have, who have received the link to the survey as well. Because what we need to be able to identify is: Are we on track with these identified priorities um, that we have uh, I, that we are spending money on in student investment account, as well as some other funds that we'll get into at another board meeting. The last question is really about our top priority, and that is the emotional and behavioral health of our students. And so you'll see on the second page of the report, the actual dollars spent. The total budget was about 4.6 million. And you'll see by category how much we budgeted in the category, how much we actually spent in the category, and then some notes uh, pertaining to what that is and how the dollars were spent, why we went over the budget or why we went under the budget and so on and so forth. Our goal is always to fully expend our dollars on our priorities and we did that. Um, the minutes from today's meeting along with these two documents will be posted on the district website, which is also required by law. Um, so the community can um, see what it is we're doing and how we're investing our dollars. Do you have any questions about 21-22? School year and student investment. Nicole, um, just looking at this, I see the fourth line item has a contract <coughs> with local mental health provider and it had 50,000 budgeted, but then zero spent. Um, is that because they- If you look at the next line down, we went over budget. Part of it was, um, and we've combined that for the 22-23, it's the same contract. Uh -huh. So we just combined it and it came in a little bit less than we had thought okay. um, at the end of the year. Awesome. Um, and then I remember <laughs> this made, I'm not sure who this is a question for, but um, the equity diversity inclusion coordinator used to be Todd. Mm -hmm. For sure, um, I'm sorry. Is that position currently vacant? or who's running that? Uh, uh, that will be Danny, Danny in the 22-23 oh, okay. uh, student investment <laughs> account. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, so the 15th uh, is the tide meeting. Is this um, um, a part that you talked about gonna be at the tide meeting or is it before then? Yeah, at the tide meeting, we'll, we'll look at our student outcome data um, in all areas, um, we'll be talking about how we invest these dollars. 
and asking people to take a survey like, is that an effective use of the dollars? Do you know how can we how can we help communicate with our community and get input on how we should be further investing our money? Thank you. Open for a big turnout for the time. I was gonna say, so this one's this one's an important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's data all over the walls, I hear. There will be data all over the walls. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All okay. right. Trish, you wanna grab Susan and have her share about the EL night from last week? Yeah. I'll grab her. Here, I'll <laughs> grab her. <laughs> she was hiding back there. We um last Thursday night we had our first annual because we have grand plans to continue it, uh fall um EL family night. So we invited all of our um families who are students who are in um EL pro the EL program, so they're active students. We, it was um, held at the Wild River Pub. Dinner was provided. It was inclusive of plant families, so it wasn't just about the parents. It was um, families. We had 52 non-staff members and about 10 staff members-ish, I think, there. So we had a great turnout. And then our two EL teachers, Tim Bartelt and Jorge Padilla, um, did a, pre a bilingual presentation, basically just um, giving the overview of what the EL program is. So how do students um, get invited into the program? Um, what are the goals of the program? Um, you know, ways that the they as an EL team, the family liaisons and uh, Tim and Jorge, how they can support families in all areas of their education, even outside of the ELD class. So um, it, was, it was great. Left out the most important part. Tim. Mr. Sweeney was the foosball champion. <laughs> <laughs> with Tim Bartell. Yeah. With Mr. Bartell. <laughs> I don't want to take all the time. Just because I scored four of them. That's cool. <laughs> okay. Was that oh. Miss Benefuse? Or... <laughs> Uh, moving on to 5.0, superintendent reports. Um, I wanted to let the board know that we're, we, and I say we very generously because it's very little to do with me and a lot to do with the fellow and her team, um, are going to be changing our accounting software system next year and our personnel system. We're going to move out of the, truly out of the 1980s and into the 21st century, 22nd, 21st century, 2022, whatever it is going to be. Um, we're get, going away from the green screens. Uh, I think we're the second generation after Commodore 64 is what we're actually running right now. Um, so they've been doing a lot of work with that and trying to get things that will, they're mocking me because I know I had a Commodore 64. Um, uh, so I just wanted to let the board be aware of that. This is going to be a at least a year, maybe a year and a half process. Um, we won't begin until later this year, but did want to let you know that this is the direction we're going to be heading. Um, there's going to be a lot of swear words coming from the business department because they learned Not the system. Not from me. But <laughs> once, they, once they learn the system, it will be, it will be vastly superior to what we have. I know a little bit about it because we did that transition in the last district. Um, and so uh, just wanted to make you aware that they're going that way. Uh, Back on October 24th, some of us were able to go to the OSBA Legislative Roadshow in Mefford, and uh, we learned a little bit about what some of the agenda items OSBA will be working on. Um, and they are also creating a rural uh, subcommittee yeah. that will be uh, really listening to the voice of rural Oregon. They have to define um, rural first. They have to define what is rural. Right now, I don't think grants passed would qualify under the definitions. Um, but you have to have a school in your district under 200, or your entire district has to be under 200 students' population to be qualified as rural. Um, that's, that's a little bit silly. 
Well, that's true. We could count gladiola. We just have to move on. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we we learned some good things about what they're going to be working on as far as their legislative priorities for the coming year. Of course, a big portion of that's going to be the state school fund. Uh, right now, the state government is, uh, we're hearing numbers about $9.5 billion for the biennium. Uh, that's an increase of $200 million or $100 million increase per year. That will not keep up with the salary demands across the state that we're seeing um, for both unions. Um, we're going to need closer to $10 billion in order to meet those needs. And so we'll be working with our uh, folks in Salem to try and increase the state school fund. That's going to be critical for us. Um, finally, we had our first facility advisory committee. We went to the secondary schools. Well, I, that's not true. We didn't get to yeah. um, We went to Grants Pass High and to North and South. And the facility committee, I think that's important for the whole board to understand. It's not about creating new facilities. We all know we need two new middle schools. It's really how do we improve the facilities that we currently have until such a point as we can pass a bond. And what does passing a bond look, look like and how long do we have to wait before we go out for another attempt? Um, so <laughs> it's one of those situations where we look at Grants Pass High School and say it looks really great and it does, but it's 25 years old and it has not had a lot of, you know, routine <laughs> because it's been the new building for so long. And we put a lot of effort into the older buildings, but if we continue to have that kind of uh, <coughs> attitude, we're going to be having problems with Grants Pass High School in very short order. So we're working on that. We're working with all the problems that North and South uh, currently have. So it was good conversations. We, we shared a lot of information back and forth. At our next one, we'll be going to the elementary schools as well and taking a look at those. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up at our elementary schools is ADA access um, for our playgrounds in particular. There, that was, um, for as new as some of our buildings are, that was not something that was planned well. So we're working on that and having those conversations. And that's really the things that are, are happening at uh, the bigger picture kind of level you know, in the district. Yes, sir. Um, for facility advisory, I'm sorry I couldn't make it to that meeting. Um, are those going to be quarterly? Is that the plan? Yeah. Do you think quarterly is adequate or do you think more frequent is, <coughs> is needed for that? Well, I don't know that more frequent is needed because we're still faced with the fact that we don't we only have a finite amount of cash to do any repairs to it. So it's really going to be okay. Let's take a look at it and how are we going to plan to use the monies we're going to set aside for facilities next year effectively. Um, my understanding is, is that the district sets aside about $500,000 a year. Is that about right for facility upgrades? Does that sound high? Does that sound low? I thought that's what I heard. Sounds like what's our immediate past present, past practices been. Okay. So how do we leverage those funds to the most effective use? Yeah. And I'd really love to run some city water to Redwood and to South. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like those phone calls. So, um, and I was pretty sure that I shared this. At no point during the interviews did anybody tell me we had significant water issues at South and Redwood. So, you didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we're still working on those even this year. Anything else you have questions? Just piggybacking on the legislative road show. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. So, the past few legislative sessions, and they expect it to be in the future also present and future talking about board training for uh, uh, board members. And I thought Jim Green's comment was interesting. He said, if that does pass, 
we would be the only elected officials in, anywhere the, state in the state of Oregon that would have a requirement to have training. Correct. And I hadn't looked at it from that perspective before, so I thought that was interesting. And I was not actually aware that the law passed that board members now have to do quarterly fiscal uh, report. Oh, I think it's passed. Yeah. Right. I think that email came out. Yeah. You're going to have to tell us where you get your money from. You have to do all that disclosing. So, what money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so no, I mean, for and not to pick on anybody, but for an example, is that because uh, we were really thinking about this, how does that work? Well, we give Project Youth Plus a hundred thousand dollars a year to work with our students, but Brenda's employed by Project Youth Plus. Is that a conflict of interest? Well, I don't know that it is. We've been doing it for a long time, but those are the things they're trying to find out what are the connections to and things like that. So, um, just another way to make board members really glad they volunteered to do this work. <laughs> I vote for a stipend. <laughs> we could list our income from being school board members. I think that's all we have to report. <laughs> all right. Um, so, moving on to board reports and special concerns. Is there anybody? Do you want to go on? Yeah, yeah, do you want to go on the agenda items first? Do what? Do you want to vote first? Well, there seems to be a difference of opinion whether you're doing 6.0 <coughs> or 6.1. 6.0. We just finished superintendent report. So we didn't actually list a 6.4, which is where we usually chime in with our stuff. I just saw so I was starting at the beginning. So you want me to Debbie, go. <laughs> go, Debbie. Okay. So Sunday I went to the um, Grants Pass High School Theater um, musical, Rank, and uh, so I wanted to recommend that to everyone who hasn't seen it yet. Um, but uh, I was impressed with some of the volume out of these little tiny bodies. <laughs> um, but it's a very thoughtful um, uh, musical of stressed students um, worried about grades, basically, and the rankings of this special high school and um, the <clears throat> way that different um, students and parents dealt with that. The students also um, made a pitch for uh, giving to the Family Advocate Fund, um, which provides financial support for students in need of school materials, scholarships for participation fees, and general mental health needs. So I thought I would mention that. And then um, last weekend, I also um, went to the four-way community foundation celebration dinner and the speaker was Michelle Wild Anderson who has this book The Fight to Save the Town Reimagining Discarded America and she focuses on four cities across the United States and Josephine County is one of them and um, so Page 15 has a particularly interesting summation of the uh, rural Josephine County has long attracted people looking for more than fertile land. They want to escape things, taxes, suburban materialism, child support debt, homophobia, arrest warrants, the urban cost of living, day jobs, nuclear annihilation, clothing, California, <laughs> but um, it's a, a very thoughtful book um, talking about spiraling poverty situations. Um, uh, another uh, city talked about the Stockton, California, 
um, Lawrence, uh, Massachusetts, which was a mill town, a clothing mill town, and um, then Detroit, Michigan. And uh, I guess a positive hint of a direction to go would be to concentrate on um, the careers in the, the um, health uh, um, sector and also education. So, but I highly recommend it. And um, so the author wrote my book, Debbie, keep fighting to save and serve Josephine County. <laughs> And there's lots of copies at Oregon Books. I'll give them a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, um, well worth the effort to read. So in our packets, we have to vote on- I have, sorry, I have an item. Okay. Um, it's very quick. Um, I have, um, friends who have high school students and I've heard that um, there may be um, somewhat of a loophole in attendance in some of the physical education classes that they are exploiting. So I just wanted to pass that on to make sure that that's tight. So that's all. Okay. I'd love to know more about that. Okay. I want to say something too. So, <laughs> so last, last month, um, me and Tim have been working together um, creating an equity community team, and uh, which is really nice because we're bringing in um, agencies that are working with our schools already, and they're people of color. So it's kind of nice to have a table where they're kind of talking about how we're all working together and how, you know, equity and inclusive is affecting our students of color within their, their you know, population. So... Um, we have somebody from Ocho this, this coming week, next week, we're gonna have somebody from Options and RCC. And like I said, it's just nice having voices of people of color. So maybe we can kind of work with Tide once we get this group and then working together with Tide. That would be great. Anybody else? Scott, you're quiet down there. Well, I got to go to Riverside this last couple of weeks ago and uh, read to the first graders. I didn't bring it in my special books, oh. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, that was a neat experience. But I also got to take a little tour and see the woodworking uh, department that they had there. It was, it was quite uh, fascinating. Uh, I, I, we haven't seen any business come from that. No fingers lost yet, which has been good. <laughs> but uh, just a compliment to the Riverside uh, Elementary School for what they're doing over there. Parkside. Parkside. Or Parkside, sorry. Parkside. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll compliment her. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of Robs, a couple of sides. Of sides. <laughs> you know, what, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of Robs. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so we have uh, to cast our vote for the board of directors for OSBA. Um, we had all three of them in our packet. Hopefully, you've had time to look at them. Um, does anybody have a preference in the form of a motion? Start out that way. You want to talk so about it? You need to. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? Oh, never mind. <laughs> well, I'll go with uh, I move that Sherry Streitenberg would be our regional representative. Is there, who else available? Don Watson, who is the um, from Phoenix Talent School, is, okay. is the current person who's been on, on that job for, a while. for a while. Yeah. And then also Clement Ray Williams, who's the Prospect Charter School District. Not for it. it's the third. There are three of them. There's three of them. Oh, I only thought there were two. Who was the who was the second one? Oh, Don and who are the other two? So Ray Williams and Clement Ray Williams are the two that are on the board of directors. Okay. And then Clement Ray Williams is the new board of directors. And Gary just nominated Sherry Spreitenberg, who's from the Eagle Point School District. 
Now, we see on the material we looked at first time around, that thing, or the group two. It was in your packet. It, it was, yeah, she gave a, it, it was some information you had. She gave a little speech at the OSBA Roadshow also. So all oh, three of them, yes, all now, three of them. Uh, Eagle Point. Yes. Uh, we did nominate somebody from Eagle Point recent, in recent years. Okay. I don't know if it was that person, but I would like to see Eagle Point get involved. Okay. So you're making a motion? Yes, for Eagle Point. I'll make a second. Okay. All right. Discussion. Yes. Hearing a second, is there a discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to ask Gary if he can provide any insight why he prefers this person over the <coughs> current individual. You're gone. Yeah. Um, Sherry is very involved. Um, I've seen some of her work. She's pretty good at some of the stuff that she does. And I feel she be really good at bringing information back to Southern Oregon. So, thanks. Don Watson, I think, was uh, started off by uh, the man that was there for years. Uh, what's his name? I remember him. I can see him in my mind. I can't yeah. remember his name. Well, he knew, he knew that uh, he needed to recruit somebody because he was leaving, and that was Don Watson. So she's been in there a, a few years, as you said. But again, Eagle Point didn't get an opportunity during all that time Phoenix Talent had it. So I, that's why I like to vote. <coughs> OK. After discussion, um, are we doing Tanya roll call for that? Member Nelson? Yes. Member De La Grange? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Brownell? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Wolf? Yes. All right. Next up is the um, adoption of the OSBA resolution. Principles of equity. Um, uh, going to the membership for approval. It's for them to you're taking action on this. Yes. Action on it. Yes. Yeah. Like her or now? Now. Take a motion. Uh, member Lee LaGrange moves to approve. I'll second that one. Any discussion? Well, I would say that um, there's many good things in here. There's some things that don't fit particularly well for us, but I think OSBA is trying to address some of that stuff with their rural caucus thing. So it's probably as good as it's going to get coming out of OSBA. Um, so I was looking for the recap for, for Cliffs. So I'll just mentioned some of their priorities are promoting adequate, predictable, stable funding, protecting the Student Success Act, closing the opportunity gap, containing costs, supporting local governance and opposing mandates, supporting capital improvements, ensuring access to post-secondary credits, addressing education workforce shortages, um, Supporting student safety and wellness, um, attracting good personnel, good governance and operations, and, and advocating.
advocating the, for the federal government to prioritize, streamline, and fully fund programs that support students. That's their mission. Uh, I like my second. <laughs> Tanya, can we have a roll call vote? Member Nelson? Yes. Member De LaGrange? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Brownell? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Okay, we get to take a field trip this week. So are there any questions? Uh -huh. That's true. I know. Does anybody have any questions about the convention this weekend? And can you arrive to the district office? <laughs> to the district office. So we sent I sent an email earlier out that you guys are going to be leaving at 3:30, and we've had some discussion <laughs> that we might want to leave earlier than that. Nathalie is willing. To take um, all of those who won't be riding with Danny um, by 11 or 12. Yeah. I want to not. She would prefer to drive in the light. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I want on that car too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good driver. Would yeah. you like to leave it <laughs> noonish or 3 30 ish? I can leave in more daylight. <laughs> okay. So we'll set the time for 11, 12, which one? 11. 11. 11. Okay, so I need to call the rental car to get them earlier. I'll do that in the morning, tomorrow morning. And then, so be here at 11. Nathalie will need to pick up. Nathalie and Danny will be in the cars. And then I'll pick, pick you up. Oh, I pick can up grab Debbie. Debbie. Oh, you no, can grab, grab Debbie? Oh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll okay. figure it out. All right. okay. Thank you. Yes. So are we all still going? Um, um, I'm waiting to see <laughs> um, how this, we're not all going. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out if I go, when do I go? And so uh, it sounds like it might look like since I travel every year with my wife to this convention, and we have a celebration up there in the off hours uh, with our family. We probably have about 10 people there um, celebrating birthdays and so forth. So I might need to talk to my wife before I find out if maybe um, I can go with maybe Danny, have not talked to Danny yet. And uh, I'm wondering if leaving at 3.30 is, Awkward for anybody in that car. What's that? Leaving at three thirty. Is that too late? No, I don't think Gary can leave till then. I think Gary's driving. Gary's driving. He's riding. <laughs> oh, oh Gary's <laughs> rolling. Okay, you, you did too. I'm going in the late car. The late car, <laughs> so you can work more. Right. Yes. But you still feel you'll be at, you'll arrive in Portland <clears> and be situated. Uh, in order to get together in the evening. Yes. I'm not, I'm not worried. But I'm not sure how fast Danny drives. Well, <laughs> but yes, we should. They should okay. arrive. Here. I have yeah. some notes that I've kept that say yes. that that's the plan. Yes, that's still the plan. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I need to talk to my wife, and then I can tell find out whether I need to talk to Danny or. Right. Um, but it sounds like. Um, how do you pronounce it? Nefeli. My name Nefeli. Yeah. Nefeli. As a full car, probably, if you have, and Debbie and you mm -hmm. is three. Is there anybody else going here? Cassie. Would Cassie Cliff, go do you want to ride in the light car or the dark car? Pardon? Do you want to ride in the light or in the dark? Yeah, well, I'm yeah. trying to figure out where somebody suggested that instead of my wife driving <laughs> shotgun in our car, uh, like we've always got done, should we both be invited to ride in a car that has room for two people? I, I don't think that we can. You can't have do we, that? We have two cars that we have rented that are going up, at a, at, so that's not a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem. Okay, so There's I've got plenty to, of room. I just have to find out <coughs> what you know. Right. Because coming back, Danny won't be with us. So we have to have enough cars to get everybody 
We will. <laughs> so Danny is coming back Saturday, I thought. Yes. Okay. Is Gary with Danny? Come back Saturday, yeah. 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 I'm coming back whenever the car goes. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's what I need to know. We're not leaving anybody in Portland. We're bringing you all back. That's not later. Okay. Moving on. There you go. All right. Um, so the policy actually are, yeah. Can, um, we, can we continue this meeting until at least the polls have closed? <laughs> no. no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, gonna I'm need a rest or a break. I gotta go here in a bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Where are you going? I got, I got other things to do. <laughs> yeah. All right. So 7.0 are action items. Um, the policy advisory committee um, are ma is making these recommendations for the first reading. Um, on policies 7.1.1 through 1.8. Um, is there a motion as a whole, or do we want to take them each individually? Yep. So I that we, wait, well, we hold on. I forgot we have Judy in the back. Judy would like to speak yeah, to sure. 7.1. Yeah. Oh. Point one and you have three minutes. Is there a <laughs> clock keeper? Yeah. Timer for yeah, thank you, fellow board members. Three you minutes. Know, three minutes. Down. <laughs> <laughs> Got it covered. <laughs> um, talking to uh, Gary Richardson before the before your meeting started, and everything, and you no, know, I was just looking at that latest one that you're adding because everything has been added before, and I think I commented before that uh, the the thing on human sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I talked to you about that months ago, just didn't seem like there were any values, uh, family value orientation in that. You know, I was questioning that at that time. And um, now, now apparently you were saying uh, that the state has come by and said, this is what we have to include here um, on this uh, district health and sexuality education, information on uh, menstrual uh, 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 health, it's positive, da 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 da, on that last one, on that last added one. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at the right place? Okay. And I guess my question with everything is why? <laughs> I'm a white person. Uh, my college professors, I like you asking questions. It was a good thing to ask questions, which I'm glad you folks do too. So I guess, Gary, when you had mentioned that, well, we have to, you know, it's the state, and we will have to do that. Well, if that's the case, and then why are you voting on it tonight? Why are you including in the group that you're going to be voting on this time? Because if you if the state says you have to do something, my logic tells me then you don't have to vote on it. But if they're giving you an option to vote on it, then well, that raises a whole new level of plateau here, as you as you folks would probably say. So I guess my question: I don't like this particular thing. It comes across very insensitive to girls or young girls and I guess there's a packet there that includes I didn't read the back of it, but I did with the all the chew coin on the last three weeks. But with that being said, uh once again, if if, if it's going to be included, it shouldn't be voted on. But I don't like it. it. Just seems like the modesty of girls, you know, modesty seems to be doesn't seem to play a uh a role in society anymore. And you know, and I'm not saying just because of what kids wear or the new styles and everything, but just everything. It, it, I, I want to live in this community where it's very family oriented, where families matter, uh, the families get to decide. I know we have broken homes, and I think that was mentioned a lot in some of your reports tonight about because of the broken homes, we have more, uh, you know, um, more of these emotional uh, social programs in school. We have more staff here because of all that, because things are changing in our society. And I would like to see us get back to where we have the phones and people sitting at the, day, uh, the dinner table. But as uh, the superintendent was saying, you know, with things going up and, 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 and salaries going up, sometimes parents need to go out there and get those two or three jobs. Now they're not the dinner table anymore. Now we got problems. They're doing their own thing, and it's creating a lot of emotional stress for the kids. You know, not having mom and dad at the dinner table anymore. Judy, you're at 10. It, 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 10 I, seconds. Oh, 10 seconds later. Okay. So anyway, I just questioned that. And... Um, if, 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 if it's already stated, I don't even know why you're voting on it if you are tonight. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Okay. Question is, do we want to take these as a whole or individually? Um, 
I would move to approve 7.1.1 through 7.1.8 in a single motion if we can. I would second that, Debbie Brown. Okay. So having a second, um, do a roll call vote. Um, discussion. discussion. Um, it was on this policy committee that you know, discussed all of these uh, policies and our policies need to align with the Oregon revised statute and um, what was added in this one is basically um, the menstrual health portion of the policy and our policy should um, align with state standards and laws and um, that kind of hits directly on all of these. We have to align with ORSs and we want the revised statutes that um, pertain to education and our district in one policy book instead of having to refer to um, the instance 7.1 has um, eight different ORSs aligned with it. Um, the others have varying amounts. And I it's part of following the law. Any other discussion? I support following the law. But I did, uh, unfortunately, was unable to attend the uh, policy committee meeting. And I did have a potential change to 7.1.5, which is JHC Student Health Services and Retirement. And that policy is being completely replaced. It talks about a lot of services the district is going to do with students. And the only thing that I would want to make more clear in our policies is that our uh, parents are kept uh, <coughs> by any time uh, their student essentially interacts with a non teacher because they expect the student's going to be with the teacher but anytime the student interacts with somebody who's not their teacher for additional services uh, the parents should be notified when that contact occurs and I some kind of way like to modify that policy to state that the district would do that so are you talking about like when they meet with a counselor Guidance counselor or mental health? Counselor? Well, this district. Talking about when they meet with an educational assistant? Are you, well, so this particular policy is student health services and requirements. Mm -hmm. So, um, while well, I sort of, what I just spoke about is sort of general, just a general guideline, this particular policy, which relates to student <coughs> health services and requirements. Uh, <coughs> just to state in there that notification of parents of any contact with personnel under this policy or I'm not the wordsmith for that, but um, we do want the parents to know when these contacts that aren't classroom contacts occur. Aren't there some HIPAA laws <laughs> that come into play? I see nodding heads out in the audience. Most right. Of right. I just, I'm just saying District 7's policy should explicitly <laughs> state that parents will be notified for <clears throat> essentially additional services outside the classroom. 
So the district is the stand-in for the parents when the kids are here. And but the parents need to be aware of what, <laughs> what the district's doing when they're the stand-in parent. So I just want to yeah, but that was um, actually very particular to a specific piece of the health service, not all health service. But it's the first reading, so. Yeah. So do you want to go forward with the first reading and make a change between the first and second reading? Because we have a November 30th. 30th. Or do you want us to table the conversation and look at this at November 30th? I'm good with moving it forward for the first reading. I'm okay. just saying I'd like to see that change for the before we pull into it. Okay. But I guess my fellow board members to say, chance to say, Pierre, you're crazy. Pierre, you're crazy. <laughs> I would never um, say that out loud. I think there are a couple of things going on that we have to be careful of. Sure. Um, and so I think your suggestion is broader than we can lawfully allow, but I'm <clears throat> certainly willing to, to hear more thoughts on this. Yeah, sure. Right. To be interested to find what types of violations there be yes. since minor children are under their parents' care. So, but that's not necessarily always true, even in a pediatrician's office, uh, the parents. So a pediatrician may have a conversation with a patient who's less than you know 18 and they don't necessarily have to disclose that to the parents. So there are many laws that govern how this goes. So uh, I'm not a pediatrician, but I just, I know that some of those things are stated in Oregon statute and law. Um, and so I think before you begin revising some of these policies or recommending that we do or don't accept them, uh, we do, you do need to look at the laws as written already. Some of those, some of those patient uh, physician confidentiality things apply to an age group that is much younger than what most parents would even say is okay, but that is how the law is written. So. Sure. The district wouldn't be saying that doctors should not follow the law or nurses or whatever. The conversation may be private, but the fact that the child went to that person isn't private. Um, I would just encourage you to review the law that the state of Oregon has before you start making any changes to the policy. Like, I think we need to better understand what those laws actually state. So I'd recommend that we table this and have Jerry, Gary write us up a, a statement that then we can run it by legal and get the board's information. Because um, if the doctor at the table doesn't know the answer, we're not going to know the answer. Well, we're glad to get you all the information you need so you're comfortable with how you want to proceed. But just so you know, Gary, I'm very supportive of parents being notified about all of these things. Some of those things, though, the law states that, you know, that doesn't always happen. So, but I, I'm very supportive of parents being aware of everything that goes on in the school district with their kids. I, there's nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to medical issues, there are certain laws that dictate how that relationship goes and who is informed and who's not informed. And I agree. And I don't want to be the one right. And, and <laughs> certainly, I expect the people uh, that you would consult, whoever, to give us a good answer before we do that. Yeah. So, yeah, we're glad to see what we can do. So, you're good with leaving in this first reading? Yeah. So after discussion, Tanya, can we have a roll call vote? Member Nelson? Yes. Member De La Grange? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Coleman? Uh, yes. Member Brownell? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Wilkins? Yes. Okay, up for second and final reading. I'm going to review these in October. You need a motion. Range, so Debbie Brownell second. Um, discussion? Anybody have? Okay. 
So I can find the meaning of the amended oh. fees. Yeah, Hearing them. Can we have a roll call then? Amber Nelson? Yes. Amber Delagrange? Yes. Yes. Amber Coleman? Yes. Amber Brownell? Yes. Amber Richardson? Yes. Amber Yes. Okay, right. 7.3. Yes. Uh, current events plan for state. <coughs> Mr. Shunk gave a report. Um, take action. Mr. Strange moves to approve. Mr. Aguilera seconds. Moving second. Is there a discussion? Any discussion? Oh, Brenda. All right. Moving forward. Roll call vote. Yes, please. Member Nelson. Yes. Member Delagrange. Yes. Member Aguilera. Yes. Member Coleman. Yes. Member Brownell. Yes. Member Richardson. Yes. Member Wilkins. Yes. Um, we got lots of action tonight. Seven point four budget calendar for the twenty three twenty four budget cycle. Um, is there a motion? Remember Taylor Grange, some of them. Yeah, but he has somewhere to go. I'll be back with that. All right, second. Yes. Is there any discussion? All right. Emma Nelson? Yes. Emma Taylor Grange? Yes. Emma Aguilera? Yes. Emma Coleman? Yes. Emma Brownell? Yes. Emma Wilkinson? Yes. Emma Wilkins? Yes. 8.0. Future meeting dates and suggested agenda items. We have the OSBA convention coming up um, Thursday through Sunday. Type meeting, we have November 15th at 5:30. Policy committee or advisory committee to the superintendent, November 30th at 5 p.m. Strategic planning advisory committee to the superintendent is December 13th at 3. And our next board meeting is December 13th at 5:15. Workshop Wilkins, we do need RSVPs from all board members if they're going to be attending the Thai meeting. Okay. Will you be attending Thai? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck tonight. Would you like that now or by calendar? Do you want that now or by calendar? Calendar. Okay. All right. So I adjourn the meeting and I call a five minute break before we come into it.